there's still something missing in our research in this great cosmic conflict. Perhaps an ancient Hebrew truth long forgotten. I need to consider how the multidimensional reality of the universe plays a role in this conflict and what really happened when Lucifer fell and how it created a dark force within his being that empowers the kingdom of darkness and why the ancient mystery religions, the Nazis, the Freemasons, and the Luciferian elite seek to master this force. And why does this rebellious immortal need humanity in his war against God? Most of all, how the remnant can respond in the last days to all this new information. In his best-selling book, The Shinar Directive, Dr. Michael Lake took us down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that had engulfed our planet. It would seem that esoteric societies had nearly fulfilled Nimrod's dark directive. However, the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his A-team for the final showdown without responding with his own. God is raising up people around the world that are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber to answer Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, His Sharif. Hell may have its directive, but Heaven has its imperative. The Sharif imperative, empowering the remnant to overcome the gates of Hell, is now available through Biblical Life Resources. It is time for the remnant to awaken and empower themselves to become a part of Heaven's Special Forces. Part 32 of Understanding the Kingdom. And it's kind of interesting, this week I did an um, interview on radio out of Denver, and they were referring to the YouTube channel. They didn't know there was anything else on there but Understanding the Kingdom. There are actually other videos <laughs> prior to that, even though it seems like we have, may have been on this forever. But one of the, the things I get more than anything are emails from people saying, please don't stop. There, there is a hunger right now for the kingdom of God because people are waking up and they're wanting more. They're wanting the real. They're tired of churchianity. They're tired of religiosity. They want real that is Jesus-centered, that is kingdom of God-centered. And I'm excited with what God's doing right now. Um, I want to just, just shift this a little bit because in our next session I'm going to preach the cross, which I'm really, really looking forward to because it is literally the epicenter of everything. Everything changes with the cross of Christ. But before we get there, I want to deal this morning with, with John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. And the thing that the last few days has left in my spirit that leapt off the pages is found in verse 21, but I want to start here in verse 20. Now this is the Passion Week. This is during uh, working up to, to Passover when Jesus uh, is up there and He's being examined for one week before He's given or it's prior to His Passion Week. And just like the lamb of old, they had to examine the lamb so many days, and, and so they examined him. And during all of this, we pick up here in verse 20, and now there were some Greeks among them who went up to worship at the feast. I think that's funny that while all, all the Jews were, were headed to Jerusalem for the feast, that this is a prophetic significance that, that amongst all them were a bunch of Greeks. And it doesn't stipulate that they were God-fearing Gentiles. They were just Greeks. And why does John bring out Greeks? Because there were those that were desiring to come out of the mystery religions for something that was real. Selah. Listen to what they said in verse 21. And when they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, Sir... We would see Jesus. You need to underline that in your Bible. That right now is the cry of humanity that there are many today that are awaking to the draconian measures that are manifesting within mystery Babylon. And like the Greeks in Jesus' day, they are going to begin coming up amongst those that keep the feasts. 
and their heart cry is in the midst of all this, we want to see Jesus. You know, as we study the kingdom of God and the dynamics of the warfare between these two kingdoms, what we have to make sure that we never do is you cannot forget the king of the kingdom. And much of the Hebraic Roots movement is guilty of that. Much of the Baptist movement is guilty of that. Much of the Pentecostal full gospel movement is guilty of that. We have lost sight of the true Jesus, and we have made a Jesus that we're comfortable with. I remember <clears throat> studying for ministry at the ripe age of 13 in a missionary Baptist church that I was told that when Jesus went up to John the Baptist, you see, I thought Jesus was establishing a church, but I found out when I was studying for ministry that John was establishing a movement called Baptist. And Jesus was baptized into the first church of John. He became a Baptist that day, that he stopped being a Jew and he became a Baptist. Thinking that mikvah was something that John created when actually it was first introduced by Moses. Uh oh! <laughs> Interesting. And so we, we, we make this Baptist Jesus. And you, you think that's funny? I've actually been here, oh, it's been over a decade ago. I was at a very large Baptist church. And I was teaching, and, I, and I, made, I made the audacious statement that Jesus not only was a Jew, but a practicing rabbi. And first of all, you could feel the air being literally sucked out of that auditorium. And then you could hear a pin drop. They inhaled, but they never exhaled for about 20 minutes. Why is that? We, we, we have... We have made a Jesus that we are doctrinally comfortable with. But it's not the real Jesus. It is a fractured portion or a glimpse of a perspective of Jesus. But what's going to bring wholeness to the world is seeing a whole Christ. Did Jesus teach repent to get saved? You betcha, baby. Did he preach baptism? You betcha. He also preached that there's another baptism coming called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We're going to be getting into that in the days ahead. He also taught on keeping the commandments. And all the Protestant movement said, what? But to keep Jesus in context, I like what John Gar said in, in his book on, um, on family worship. He said that Jesus did not teach in a vacuum. If you, if you take him out of the Jewish first century Judaism context of what Jesus said, you're, you're in danger of building false doctrines. You're in danger of twisting his words to mean something else. We have got to strive, first of all, for us to discover the true Jesus. And I think for most of us in evangelicalism, now there's, there's this emergent church thing and a whole lot of other things. They're dealing with some new age type of Jesus. I mean, Jesus could dine with the sinner, but the sinners knew that he wouldn't tolerate the sin. You could have a prostitute sitting at the table as well as a gambler or whatever when he dined with what was called sinners. But how many know there was no business being conducted at the table? Rather, there were people looking for a way out. That's why he said, I am a physician sent to those that are sick. They got up and left that table and left their sin at that table to do it no more. But what we have done is we have created a Jesus that will sit at the table and dine with them and say, it's all okay. 
No, it's not. He always called them. His basic message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that was the basis of his entire ministry. So to take his ministry outside of that, you're dealing with another Jesus. But what I believe many of us done is we have taken a glimpse or a portion of who Jesus is and we have camped outside the promised land, out in the wilderness, and said, that's all there is. This is our little camp. This is our little perspective. I love what Bob Mumford said years ago in teaching on the whole Christ. He said, each one of us, and, and this even goes for ministries, guys. There are those that are teaching, let's say, in areas of the Hebraic heritage that I'll never touch. It's not my assignment. It's not their assignment to teach what I teach. And even some of my, old my own colleagues, when they look at the way that I handle Genesis 6 and a lot of other things, they're scratching their heads, they see the fruit, but they say, I don't want to touch that. You know why? That's not their call. And I cannot do what they do, nor can they do what I do. Each one of us have a portion of the ministry of Jesus in the earth today. And it takes all of us working together, walking together for the world to see the whole Christ. But here's what, what God begins stressing on me when we, we can't forget the king, the power, the provision, the direction, and even the very nature of the kingdom flows from the king alone. Therefore, if they're really doing what God tells them to do, that we, we will fit together like a piece of the puzzle, or like the Apostle Paul said, there are different parts to the body, but they work because they're all wired to the brain and move in concert with the king instead of fighting amongst themselves. If my right hand starts fighting with my left hand, how many know that it means there's, there's, a, there's a short circuit, there's something wrong in the body? My right hand needs to do what it's supposed to do. My left hand's supposed to need. My feet are supposed to do what they're supposed to do. My lungs are supposed to do what they're supposed to do. I can't breathe with my ears. You see, there's a lesson to be learned here because every one of us, that there, there, there have been people that I've seen on the internet want me to fight with other people on other ministries because they're doing a different portion. I'm not going to do that. They're doing what they're doing, and they're doing it in the level of revelation they have, and if they're being faithful to Christ, they're His servant. He'll correct them. The only time that I ever feel the need to step in is when I feel that people go so far off in error that they're going to cost people their souls, and then I will come out against the error, but never the individual. God can deal with them. I'm to be faithful in what I'm supposed to do. Because in everything that happens, is supposed to have the nature of Jesus flowing in it. Now one of the things that we have today, or we need to realize, any deviation from the character of the kingdom is a twisted manifestation of the king. You see, we have a lot of people today that would prefer a blending of the old nature with the new nature because they have itching ears that want to tell them that their sin is okay. How many know the Word of God says your sin isn't okay? Now in verse 21 of 12, John is a, prophet, is a powerful prophetic event scattered among the Jewish worshipers or, Jesus, or Gentiles that want to see Jesus. And let me tell you something, even though while traditional Christianity is imploding and even much of what we call the megachurch, if they would really be truthful, there, there are literally thousands of former mega churches in America whose buildings have been foreclosed on and are empty today all across america much of them are imploding because the people got tired of cotton candy they got tired of programs and there is a yearning on the inside of them for something more they want the real jesus they want the real word and they long for more i call it the remnant and the remnant are abandoning traditional churches by the score 
and I think it's necessary. One of the things Mary and I was talking about this morning, you know, for over 30 years I've been doing biblical life, college, and seminary, and I see myself transitioning. I have tried for 30 some odd years to give ministers the tools they need to return back to the Word of God. And what many of them, now there have been some exceptions. I mean, I've got some, I, I have some exceptional students that I rejoice in God over, I'm so proud of. But I also see that there's the 80-20 principle. 80% come just for something to hang on their wall and go back teaching whatever their denomination teaches, and they have discarded everything else. 20% are rocking the world. And I say, rock on. But I, I see this transitioning. What God is transitioning me to do is I am moving from trying to change the pulpit I'm beginning to work on everything right now about our ministry is ministering to those that have left the pews. Because what we're seeing right now in Washington is a reflection of the same thing that's going on in the church. Because just like we had the political corruption that goes on in Washington with Mystery Babylon influencing it, we have had Mystery Babylon so influence the politics of the church and so cause the gospel to be twisted, the only way to change it is grassroots of the sheep saying, I am tired of artificial turf. I am tired of cotton candy. I don't go to the church for a Tootsie Roll. I go to the church for the meat of the Word of God. If I need to be corrected, correct me. If I need to be corralled, corralled me. If I need to learn how to crucify the flesh, teach me how to crucify the flesh. That is the heart cry of the remnant. We need to understand that in our walk in the kingdom, if we're truly walking in the kingdom... We begin growing up to become more and more like the king. If we don't, we're just deceiving ourselves. Everywhere we see in the word of God. And the apostle Paul knew the significance of Abram. Abram was a, was a citizen of Babylon that God called him out of the Babylonian system. And as he walked with God, he became a prince of God in the earth named Abraham. And that is the call of all of us. And the more that I walk with the king, the more I take on the characteristics of my king. And if your church doesn't do that for you, then it's not the pasture of the Lord. And what I love in this that the Greeks were looking for him. Listen up. There is a longing among those caught in the Babylonian system. There is a longing for them to see a people on this planet that represent the king. They know that if they ever see him, then they can let go of Babylon, which never satisfies, and reach to a kingdom that is greater. That is the task of the remnant today, is to represent Jesus. Now how do we do that? Well, let's go on. In verse 23. I mean, know that what I find interesting is as Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, he went back through Samaria. And there were still a lot of Samarians stuck on thou shalt... They had 11 commandments in, in, the, in the Decalogue from Moses. In the 11th one, they added to the Torah that says, Thou shalt worship the Lord God on Mount Gerizim. And so as Jesus is going through Samaria... They said, stay here and celebrate Passover here. And G the Bible says, Jesus had set his face like flint to Jerusalem. He knew why he was headed there. They got mad at him and re began uh, rejecting him. And that's when you have, you have uh, the sons of thunder say, Lord, shall we call fire down on him? 
I mean, that does, and they weren't necessarily talking about revival either. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. I'm headed to Jerusalem. And so now we, we find him saying in verse 23, And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it is alone. This morning as I read that, the alone just leaped off of the page. The alone. I have never thought about God feeling alone. Now, if you have a heart that is so big, it is beyond description. How do you define the depths of the aloneness of God? Because God created humanity to be a family. Because there was something in his nature as father that longed to have children that would walk with him. That would be a part, an expression of his kingdom. And guys, it takes every single soul that has walked faithfully with God since Adam until the Lord's return. All of them combined to fill the heart of God. It was at that moment that I realized the depth. Did you just hear what God said? He said, I feel alone. Therefore, I am going to come and I'm going to give my life so that I can get my family back. Because I'm tired of being alone. But he said, now if I die, I'll bear much fruit. Jesus knew that the cross was before him. He saw the significance of the... And what, what, what? We, we can't take this verse out of context of the Greeks coming in because that, that is the precipitating factor that caused this entire dialogue. Jesus knew... While Jesus was standing there, Jesus knew that Peter one day would be sitting on a housetop and he would give him a vision of how God was going to sanctify and make holy the Gentile, not your lobster, the Gentile. And he knew that he had given, the key. Peter preached the first sermon after the day of Pentecost to all the Jews and had enough boldness to point his old bony finger at them and said, whom you crucified. How many know that was a bold, bold statement? That same Peter went to the house of Cornelius, who was a God-fearer. He worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He walked in the Torah. He ate kosher, but he would not physically become a Jew. And Peter went to him and preached the gospel, took the key of the kingdom, unlocked the door, and to his own amazement. Listen to me. I've, uh, now, if, if you're a preacher, listen to this. Have you ever seen God do something after you preached that you had no idea what God was after before you preached it? And you sat there in amazement watching God do something, and you almost had to catch yourself saying, I almost stopped it because I didn't realize what God was doing. And that, that's, there's a reason why after he preached salvation and the cross to Cornelius that the Holy Ghost immediately fell and they began prophesying and speaking in tongues. It happened so quick that Peter didn't have a chance to shut it down. And then he went back to Jerusalem and said, Whoa! <laughs> Look what God did! Because he understood, Jesus understood when he was making this statement. He said, it's going to take all of mankind. I want to empty out mystery Babylon so that Nimrod would stand alone and that I would have my house filled because I am tired of feeling alone. It's his turn. 
That's the heart cry of God. He was prophesying in that situation, when you put it back in its context, he was prophesying the Gentiles becoming a part of those called out of Babylon. The ecclesia or the gahal of what Israel itself was supposed to represent, he was going to call the Gentiles. How do we get there? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 25. Now he says, okay, I'm getting ready to lay down my life. And then he turns to his followers. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Wherefore I am there my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. We need to understand two kingdoms. You have the kingdom that is manifested through Mystery Babylon that encompasses everything of planet Earth. Everything in this carnal world. From the need to be seen, from the need to have that can never be satisfied, with all the carnal lusts of it, he said, for you to be able to get a hold of third heaven realities, the only way you can do it is you're going to have to let go of this other and reach for something more. If you let go, I will fill your hands with something more. But you've got to hate this and love this. And what we have had is we've had so many ministries that hold on to the lower. Come on. While preaching that promising the upper while establishing everything in the lower. Do you know how you can prove that? By the fruit of their ministries. Now I want to look at the fruit of the lower life. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And we are going to be dealing with these in more detail in the days ahead. I know I did a, uh, for the seminary, I did a, what, 18, 19 sessions on the fruit of the Spirit, and everybody was sorry to see it close. But listen to this. Now, the works of the flesh, or the Spirit, or the life that man drew from the Nechesh, and the wisdom that he promised, this is what it produces. So as long as you are drawing from this, it will always produce this. Okay? The works of the flesh are revealed, which are these. Adultery, sexual immorality. What's sexual immorality? Sexual expression beyond the boundaries of the Word of God is sexual immorality, which is a manifestation of the old nature. And all we have today is the old nature says, if I get enough people to march, you may be able to change Washington, but you will never change the kingdom. And you will be judged one day for ch trying to change the Word of God. Impurity, lewdness, Idolatry. Now let's just stop there. Let's just take these several of them here and go to the ritual that was held in the front of Vice President elect Pence's home. It was called a protest, it was not. It was a ritual that was filled with adultery, sexual immorality, impur impurity, and lewdness. It was mystery Babylon manifesting in front of his house so that he would know when he takes on the role of vice president as a Christian, they wanted to remind him what he has to stand against and what he's fighting. Because it wasn't just people holding signs. They were dancing and they were doing every lewd act or emulating every lewd act imaginable in the front of his home. 
I'm sure him and his family huddled down that home and they could feel the waves of Babylon hitting that household. You look at the fruit and you see the force driving behind it. Now, do I believe in treating people bad? No. And let me say this. As an American looking at the Constitution, your sin does not define your rights in the Constitution because if that was so, nobody in this nation would have constitutional rights. Two separate things. But you, can't, you can say, okay, this crowd represents a portion of the United States of America. That's good and well. But it doesn't represent the kingdom of God. And there is a difference. Let's go on. Idolatry. Sorcery. Sometimes we have things being preached from the pulpit that are closer to sorcery than they are the Word of God. Strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunken, carousing, and the like. Kind of sounds like some ministerial conventions. But what's going on behind the scenes? You see, all, if you have that going on, in your church or in your ministerial association, no matter the, the nice theater front that you put on every, every week, if this is going on behind the scenes, it's of the old life and not the new life. Now listen to what he says here. This, this is strategic. The Apostle Paul says, I warn you, as I previously warned you, that those who do such things. Well, I thought the cross changed. No, he said, I don't care whether you said you accepted Christ or not. If you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. That's pretty plain, isn't it? That's of another kingdom. And guys, this is what Jesus is saying. Let go of. Let go of. We have too many saints that are led by their feelings and we have been programmed by the Luciferian elite to go by our feelings because your feelings are fickle. They can easily be manipulated and they respond quite well to sorcery and witchcraft. Faith does not. Faith will not be manipulated. I like the old saying, I am not moved by how I feel. I'm moved by what I believe. A man or a woman that finds the truth of God's word and everything in them feels completely different, they will take those feelings and they will crucify them on the cross and they will command their feelings to come in line with their faith. And if you're not doing that, you are not living a crucified life. You know, it's amazing. As you listen to, they, they talk about, and, and we even had uh, former President Bush, young President Bush, get up, and as the president announced that the three or 4,000 year old promise of democracy was being revealed. Well, that's an occult promise of democracy. It's a utopia without the God of the Bible, and that utopia always ends in absolute tyranny. And even though we historically can see it over and over and over again, this week at Davos, they had the president of China say that he was going to stand up and they were going to hold up the new democracy. How many know there's no democracy in China? They have killed over 100 million of their own people. He does Hitler proud. You see, that is a draconian 
masquerading as democracy. It's their, it's their vision of trying to move into this occult democracy, Plato's Republic, and to modern works. And I, and I had a, a student write an essay on that this week, so it's fresh in my mind. Huxley's work on A Brave New World and Orwell's 1984 are two possible visions of what it was going to be like living in that utopia. Just shoot me now. How many know that we have been called to a higher kingdom? That's what they can't stand. Is we're in the world, but not of the world. Because we walk in a higher kingdom. And we, we even see this feely, touchy stuff in ministry. People are always wanting ministers to make them feel better. That's not our job, honey. That is not our job. Our job is for you to identify your sin and to hand you a hammer and to hand you a nail and say right there's the cross and this is how you drive the nail. If all ministry ever does is simply pacifies the need to feel better but doesn't do anything on the other side of that, it becomes a cup that never gets full. It's a hole that never gets filled. And what I have seen, and even what we've experienced, is you get running on that treadmill, and you can forget the rest of your ministry. You see, I, I, I have ministers that I know that are called to write. But the whole filling, cup filling has become such a big part of their ministry, they hardly have time to breathe. But they're literally, you know, the Bible talks about when, because people had, had abandoned the temple of God and let it be in disarray that they had, they had pockets with holes in it, no matter how much money you put into it, there was nothing ever there. You can't fill the hole of feeling. You can only fill the hole of faith. And it builds into a mountain. Because faith demands feelings change. Well, there's, that's a whole series right there. I told Mary this morning, coming in this morning, I said, I may need to write a book, and the title of it's going to be The Church is Full of Vampires. <laughs> because we've made ministry something that it's not. We've turned ministry into something of placating rather than crucifying. And God is calling us to do more. The carnal life is the one that we must lose. We must allow the old nature which represents the old kingdom to die, not be pacified. Then and only then can we be free to develop something higher, something more noble. And then the same Apostle Paul that told us how one kingdom is manifested begins describing the fruit of the other kingdom. Let's go on in verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, self-control. Oh my Lord, has it come to that? I just want to be moved by the Spirit. Yeah, you're being moved by a Spirit, all right. I'm going to share this. Years and years ago when I was in Germany, and I, I want to say his last name was McEach, and I'd have to go back and, and dig, and I've lost so many of my old audio tapes I used to have. But we're, and it was one of the ones that we, we held locally. And we brought in a speaker like the ones we had at Birch's Garden. They brought in Bob Mumford and Derek Prince and a lot of others, and I went to some other conferences. And so you had this woman in the black community get what a lot of people call, you know, they get the Holy Ghost and they, they start gyrating all over the place. He shut the service down right there. He shut it down. And he said, that wasn't of God. And I'm going to prove to you it wasn't of God. And he cast several demons out of her. <laughs> we need more ministers like that. I'm reminded of Prophet Deckard was talking about one church service he was in. 
And they just, they just got so caught up in singing the same song over and over and over and over and over again. And it went on for, I guess, a couple hours. He left the service, went across the street to a Dairy Queen, got an ice cream cone and came back and was sitting there licking that ice cream cone waiting for them to finish the song service so that he could preach. And, the, and after he finished his ice cream cone, got up there and said, that wasn't the Spirit of God, that was all about the flesh. Now everybody else may have walked away and say, what a wonderful service that was, because we have developed services of ministering to the people instead of ministering to God. What I'm looking for is we get so centered in on a service, it was like when Solomon dedicated the temple, that no priest could even stand to minister, that everybody was on the carpet and God was there to minister. That's when things get done. That's what we're longing for. We need to turn from a, a self-centered ministry model to a Christ-centered, crucified life ministry model that produces the fruit of the nature of the Messiah in everybody who partakes. And if you ever read many, many Facebook posts, now there are a lot of great Christians on Facebook, and Facebook, in one sense, has become the bane of my existence. That's why I only spend two or three minutes on it a day. Because for every one of, praise God, God is doing something, there'll be a post that makes blood want to shoot right out your eyes. And I mean, it is the clearest dichotomy, fruit of the Spirit and fruit of Mystery Babylon masquerading as Christianity. Let's go on against there is no such law. How many know there is a commandment against everything that Paul listed to begin with? And what's interesting in his ministry, he said there were still laws against it, and if you still continue doing it, you will not inherit the kingdom. But in this, there's no laws against it, and in fact, there's laws for it. It's a manifestation of the kingdom. Verse 24, underline this in your Bible. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its lusts. And sometimes lusts can manifest as ministerial needs. It's just another sign of the coin of lust. But he goes on to say, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be uh, contrite, provoke one another, or envying one another. There's a time, the remnant are hungry. The remnant says, just give me the truth. Don't hold back. I want it. I want more of it. I, I don't care how it makes me feel, because it may make me feel horrible, but at least I'm going to get something rectified if I find out what needs to be crucified. I'll fix what I want to fix. I need to fix. I'll change what I need to change to bring me in line with my Messiah. But the Babylonian modern church, they're given just enough to feel like they have something when they have nothing. I have talked with so many that think they know something that when I even try to get them to define what they just said they know, they can't even define it. They are cisterns without water. They have made for themselves these cisterns filled with holes and we fill them full of theological sound bites that placate the carnal nature but never transform and make you feel like you have arrived at something while you're still riding the freight train to hell. We need to move beyond that. There has to be more. Guys, as we begin to walk with the Lord, some of the first things, some of the first things, the first things He'll do is hand you a hammer and a handful of nails, and the Holy Spirit will begin going to work to show you what you need to be crucified. We have too many ministers trained in Greek and Hebrew, yet their carnal nature twists their exegesis of Scripture. 
Sometimes it's for their carnal nature and sometimes the enemy has convinced them it is strategic because if they would preach the truth, the numbers will dwindle. You know, one of the reasons why Spurgeon was able to preach with the depth that he did and not hold anything back is because he began writing down his sermons and publishing them as tracts to where his salary was not dependent upon what people gave in the offering plate. And so he preached what he knew to be the Word of God, with where they were at that place in God, and he didn't hold back to anything, and he was known as the Prince of Preachers. And what I'm believing God for right now, for everyone that is truly functioning in the kingdom, is God would give them a platform that they would never have to worry about what comes in the offering plate, that they can preach the truth and have an income separate from that. You know, I'm looking to the day that I can live 100% off the royalties for my books. I'm even wanting to scale Biblical Life College and Seminary back and just deal with the remnant with it. And all I do is write and do these teachings and everything else. And then as my books and the tapes and, and everything sell, I would, I would love to get to where 100% of, uh, of that and not one penny ever comes in the offering plate would ever go toward my salary. Because I'm, I'm living like that right now. I will preach the truth, even if the truth causes everybody to stop giving. I will find a way. Because I'm not going to let statistics and budgets ever, ever, ever influence my preaching. And Mary knows me en enough to know that I'll, whatever God gives me, I'll preach and I won't hold back. When I get up in this pulpit, Mike Lake has to die before Mike Lake gets in this pulpit. If I can't preach crucified, I'm in trouble. That's the way every ministry needs to be. And I tell you what, remnant will support that kind of ministry. Unless we have this manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit and have stopped the fruit of the flesh, there is no maturity in the faith. Laying down the one and begin manifesting the other are the fruit of the maturity. Guys, we have also had doctrines. and I want, I want, can, I, can I share something? And, and we have those that skew the word to bring in those with itching ears. And, and I thank God that I don't have to have a budget of a million dollars a month. You know, there are ministries... That some of them, it's $100,000 a month just to keep the lights on. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have that pressure. And so I don't want to judge too harshly those that do or those that have two or 300 people working underneath them that what you do can affect their livelihood and their families and their salaries and everything else. We have some that, that have done that. And on the other side, we have some that their doctrines are right on but they don't have the character of Christ to back up their doctrines. And they turn the truth of the Word of God into a battering ram when it needs to be an outreached hand to lift people up out of the miry clay. When somebody's in the miry clay, the last thing they need is a club right between the eyes. But we have those that do that. The doctrinally, they're right on, but they don't have the fruit of Christ to display it. Now for us to see the whole Jesus to bring glory to God. Number one, we need the remnant to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit which represent the power of Jesus and His kingdom. Okay. We're going to get into that more in the weeks ahead in 1 Corinthians 11, 7 through 11 deals with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God that we had the problems that we had in Corinth that Paul had to correct because it was so embedded within the church that where they were getting it right that it could, have, it could have went on and we would not have understood the gifts the way we should if they had not had the problems that Paul had to correct. He had to go back and redefine the gifts. Which means in the, in the other Gentile congregations, they were in balance and they were functioning, except possibly for the church of Rome, because they were so logic-oriented, they weren't making room for the Spirit. And so he had to tell them, don't grieve the Spirit of God. 
So we have to have the power of Jesus. But we also have to have another aspect to him. We have to show his nature in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Third, the very motivations. And I have found out motivations are very powerful because they direct the way that you use the gifts and the nature and everything else. The motives have to be right. And so Paul, after he tells them in, in Romans chapter 12, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, then he gets into the motivation because only the motivation of Christ can be displayed in a crucified life. Now some people stop right there. 1 John 2, the Apostle John made quite clear that we have got to display the way that Jesus walked in the commandments and walk in them the same way. Otherwise, we're denying who he is. John went as far as to say, he said, if you say you know him and don't do the commandments, you're a liar. That's strong words from the Apostle of Love. But let me tell you something, if you keep the commandments but you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, you're in trouble. That's when you go into real bad legalism, isn't it? And what's crazy is I have some churches that will look at that and say, that's legalism, I'm not, I'm not going to go that way. But your own traditions you're three times as legal about. And then you get, you get absolutely legal. If somebody would dare keep a commandment, you tell them you, they lost their salvation. Because you have become ultra-legal about not being legal. <laughs> Guys, it takes all of that together to show the kingdom of God. Every kingdom has to have laws. Every kingdom has to have motivations behind what they do. Every kingdom has got to have the character of the king and the power and authority of the king flowing through it. It all has to be about that king. And that's, that is what the remnant is called to do. And the first step to getting there is dealing with the cross, which we're going to get into next time, and how that the cross is the ultimate singularity in space-time. And that it changed not only the earth forever, it changed all three heavens forever. Not just the first. It was so powerful what happened there. That what Jesus did at the death, burial, resurrection, and at his ascension changed the first heaven, the second heaven, and even the third heaven was changed because of what was done. Hot dog. I'm excited. I can't wait to get into that. Well, Father, we just ask that you would just give us a fresh anointing, Father, to, to cultivate the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which can only happen by walking with Messiah. That he'll teach us how to walk and talk. He'll teach us how to crucify the flesh and how to function in the kingdom if we'll just begin the walk. And, Father, we ask for a fresh anointing in this season that the remnant can become true symbols, true reflections of Jesus because the world right now is crying out, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Father, my heart's cry is that from the hearts and lives of the remnant, that they would see this magnificent reflection of the true Christ, of the true Messiah, of Almighty God come in the flesh that they will see him as Yahweh and as Elohim, and they will see him as Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, that they will see him fully manifested through his body so that we can bring in the harvest that the heart of God would be full and his joy would be full. And Father, we thank you, we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Hello, Rim to the Most High God. This is Dr. Michael Lake of Kingdom Intelligence Briefing and Biblical Life TV. I want to personally invite you to the Hear the Watchmen Conference in Dallas, Texas on March 30th through April 2nd. I'm going to be there along with many great men and women of the Kingdom of God to include Derek and Sharon Gilbert, L.A. Marzuli, Russ Dizdar, Coach Dave, Mike Norris, Pastor Paul Begley, Josh Talley, Michael Bodea and many more. Friends, this conference is God's great gathering for 2017. 
It will serve as a G3 intelligence summit for the kingdom of God. We're going to hear great messages. We're going to hear prophetically of what God wants in 2017. There'll be time of ministry, of empowerment, times of fellowship, and networking with remnant from all across America and from around the world. For more information on this conference and to reserve your tickets, go to www.hearthewatchman.com. That's www.hearthewatchman.com. Seating's limited, so make your reservations early. And when you check out of the shopping cart, make sure that you use the coupon code LAKE, L-A-K-E, and it'll save you $20 for each ticket you purchase to this powerful conference. God bless you, and may you be empowered to fulfill God's purpose in your life in 2017.